New York and on the new Hot 97 app, Ebro in the Morning. On Hot 97. Yeah, Ladies yeah, and yeah, gentlemen, yeah, it's yeah. Ebro in the Morning. Laura Styles, Rosenberg's on assignment. The legend, Oakland. Uh, rap, too short, in the building. Blow the whistle and all of that. What up, yeah. And all of that. <laughs> um, so first, um, mm-hmm. first and foremost, um, you look incredible. I've known you a long time. Uh-huh. You know what I mean? I, and, you know, a lot of artists that have been around a long time, health-wise, uh-huh. I just got to, when when I when I see OGs, I got to salute them if they keeping themselves together. Yeah, I'm a 52 and a half. Sheesh. Still flowing, still wow. getting money, still rapping, still touring, still partying. You don't party as hard as you used to. I, it hasn't changed much. The only thing I changed now is that... Uh, I probably don't go out every day anymore. I used to go out like six, five, six days a week religiously. Now I'm down to about three. What about drinking? How do you handle that? Uh, I don't drink every day. Okay. I never okay. drink every day, but I, the, the three or four days a week I do drink, I get it in. Okay, okay, okay. But I, I've never been a drunk, though. I drink to the point where I feel it. And then I could tell myself I'm cool for a little while, and I might have another drink. Hour. I, you know, so I, I watch people just get drunk. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm like yeah. now, I got to be on point. I cannot get uh, be sitting somewhere and some girl just take my chain, you know, smiling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know what happened to it the next day. That type, that type of drunk. Nah. So, um, you um are arguably one of the most vulgar rappers in the history of rap. Would you say yes? Early on and the, the stretch, you know, like down the Freaky stretch. Freaky tales. Yeah. A lot of curse words, man, but... um, Curse words, let them roll, motherfucking shit, goddamn asshole. I think I, I, think I curse the best out of all rappers. <laughs> like, out of, like, human beings, period. I yeah, think I'm yeah. one of the best, like, foul mouths. So, using bitch uh-huh. in the way it's used in hip-hop culture, uh-huh. right? Um, I credit that to a song you did in 1985-86 called Dope Fiend Beat. Uh-huh. Is that the right place to... That's probably the song that, that made the Bay Area just... You know, just certified like we love this word. And before that was Dolomite, right? Would you say I, I gave Rudy Ray Moore a lot of credit because uh, we didn't necessarily get it from him. Got it. Because the way we, it came to us was sort of like, yeah. But I was watching the old Dolomite movie and he said it. I'm yeah. like, I'm like, okay. I, I was definitely not saying it in 1970 something. So he said it just like that too in one yeah. of his movies. Like, bitch. Yeah. I'm like, okay. So, but um, that. Call, you know what I'm mm-hmm. saying, in clubs. I was raised in Northern California, so mm-hmm. I'm very familiar. Mm-hmm. But now because of your song, Blow the Whistle, it kind of, over the last, I would say... Tennis. Tennis years has kind of become, you know, I was just at a party over the weekend, and and it Blow the Whistle came on. It, it became Everybody a real says, feel-good thing to just yell yeah. it out and say it. It's a comedian say it in their, in their bits, and... I see it on in movies and it's just it's just everywhere. But um, I'm rich, bitch. Shout out to uh, our, our boy Donnell Jones. Yeah, yeah. I mean Don, Donnell Jones. Donnell he said Rollins. on, on, on oh, the Chappelle, yeah. on the Chappelle show. Yeah, yeah, that was that was the signature thing on the show. Yeah, um, I just love the way uh, it evolved, and it was like it was the you know I was being a bad kid. You know I was like you know talking a lot of smack so uh, so that uh, I would get the shock value, and then it turns into this pop culture accepted thing where you know. Girls is like, bitch, what's up? To yeah. each other. And I'm like, it's okay. okay. I'm cool with it too. Do you feel like you get credit? I took credit because it was <laughs> it was slipping. It was slipping away. I, I remember being um a, a ear, like a fly on the wall, listening to a conversation where somebody was trying to say, you know, um, the bitch thing came from uh, Death Row. They started that. And then somebody was like, no, nah, that was too short. And it's like, no, nah, get the fuck out of here. That's too short. So it was a debate for a minute. So yeah. I think blow the whistle, that first verse just was like, you guys know who owns this. This is mine. Don't hey. have to copyright it. Don't have to tell you the story. It's too short. And it kind of like blow the whistle. Kind of made everybody back up off it. Like yeah. they know who 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 they got it from. So now it's like it's ours. We can all have it. We don't have to debate it. We know what it is. Uh, you can say it to your grandma on Sunday morning. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you popularize it. You don't. No, matter of fact, the grandma word. might say it to yeah. you. <laughs> <laughs> how I, I was going to ask you that. So when you're putting out these records, though, how did? How did your family receive it? Like, you go to Thanksgiving, they're like, is, were they like, oh, that's sure, he's just a badass, or? Yeah, well, my father really didn't acknowledge it. He was just like, go to college, go to college, do something, get a job, something like that. But my mother was extremely disturbed. I was in 11th grade. I've been writing dirty rap since, like, 10th, 10th grade. Damn. So I was in 11th grade, and... Where'd you go to school? Fremont High, Fremont. East Oakland. Yeah. And um, I go to, like... Get in one of my little rap books. That the little, you know, little, you got your rap book. Composition back in the day. book. Uh-huh. Yeah, exactly. 
and I get to a certain page, and my mother had been in my book, and she <laughs> she wrote me like a seven page letter. Oh my god! <laughs> and it was it was the biggest guilt trip you could ever do. But you know, I was getting money in, in high school, man. I I I didn't even talk to her about it. Like she was like, what? the letter was saying, "What is this? What has happened to my son?" I hope you don't believe these things. I hope you don't. You, you got to grow up as a family like you. It, like she was disturbed. And what do you feel? I'm gonna use the word corrupted. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? You being from having two parents, you know, mm -hmm. in school, your parents are encouraging you. What corrupted a young Todd? What's your, your real name? Todd. Todd. Yeah. What yeah. corrupted a young Todd to become this um, person? So I was born and raised in L.A. I moved to Oakland when I was 14, and L.A. is a whole different world yeah, than, a lot of people don't than, know than the Bay. Different. Like, it's totally different. L.A. at that time, I'm, you know, I'm talking like, I moved to Oakland in 1980. So I'm coming from L.A. It has, It's not the Crips and Bloods that you know from movies, but it's definitely still the same. Every block is a different turf. Every neighborhood is a, has different rules. Like, literally, an eight, nine-year-old kid, you got to know which block to ride down or which block not to ride down because you're not going to make it to the other side with your bike or your skates or your skate, whatever you're on, yeah. they're going to take it if you go down the wrong block. And grown men, uh, anybody. Like, it was it was a very rough city, kind of probably like New York was back then. Yeah. And then I get to Oakland, and it's more like people are like, you, you got certain status level. Like, you could be a gangster from the other side of town and go hang out way over there with some dudes just because you guys are like-minded on getting money. Right. And everybody's Bears like, cool with it. always been about the money. Yeah, so, you know, I think I really got turned out when I got to Free My High. And, it, and to me, this is like 1980. The Mac, the movie, had just been shot three years earlier. People were still, like, buzzing on that high that the, you know, Goldie and the Mac, the movie was shot totally in Oakland. With everybody in Oakland was the backdrop in the movie. It was very few actors in the movie. Mm -hmm. Rich Pryor and, you know, a few few actors. But it was Oakland people. Yeah. And that was the, the mentality of the city. So if you go look at the Mac, the movie... That's what I moved to. And you look at the cars and the people, that was not a costume. Those They wore their own clothes. So I, I'm looking at this. I've seen, at this point, I've seen the movies. I've seen Bill Cosby and Sidney Poitier. I've read the Don, Donald Goins books. I could see it in my mind. I see it on, on the screen. But then to see it on the street and to see somebody like Gangster Brown ride down the street in a Cadillac, a limousine. He's driving a limousine. He got the windows down, and in the back is like five prostitutes. Yep. And I'm like looking at it like, is this real? This movie? This is movie right in front of me. No, Oakland was like that. And then you go down to San Pablo, and you think right now, if I said pimps and hoes on the track, you know, doing what they do, you picture a bunch of crackheads. You picture something dirty, but not in Oakland, not 1980. The the whole stroll was like. It was like a, a fashion show. It was like glamorous. It was we used to go sit down on San Pablo. You say you, you, North Oakland. Yep. We used to sit down on San Pablo, like near thirty, the thirtieth, thirties, mm -hmm. somewhere in there, and just watch the show. And it was like amazing. We just it was a big deal to be like say, to say to a hoe, "Hey girl, let me get some of that." They were like, "Get out of here, little boy." You know, but it was we used to go and have fun. So I was totally fascinated with the look of it, totally fascinated with the lingo, and totally fascinated with the the power of it, where. Gangsters had, like, a hard job to do. You got to go out there and grind and fight and hold, hold some stuff down. But a pimp just, like, go get his nails done and go get tailored and get his hair done and then just wait for the money to walk up to him. I'm like, I think I could do that. The Mac. <laughs> um, the first two short album officially was Born to Mac, right? The first uh, album that went nationwide was Born to Mac. The first album they let me make was uh, Don't Stop Rapping. That was 1985. Don't Stop Rapping. Born to Mac was, like, thing. 87. So yeah. Don't Stop Rapping was... um. These are statements. My album covers have all been statements. I was like, this is what I feel my future is. Don't stop rapping. I think my, the title of my first album has always filled me to keep going. I'm like, you know what you started off saying, so you got to keep doing it. And then Born to Mac was, it was, I knew I was getting a larger audience, and I knew I was uh, that outside of Oakland in the Bay that it wasn't as blatant. Like a little kid in elementary school in Oakland, would say to a girl, uh, give me your milk tomorrow. Mm. And then she'd be like, well, I want my milk. He's like, well, if you, you won't give me your milk, you can't be my girlfriend. And then she'd give him the milk. And that's like, he got that from his big uncles telling him how to be a little pimp. And you would have little dudes be like, 
I'm a pimp. It's something like that. Like it was, it was embedded in the culture. It is to, very much a part of the barrier. Culture. Yeah, to even if you didn't really try to grow up and be like some real pimp, you still felt like one. Like you felt like I know if I wanted to, I could be one. And you had a lot of dudes who um were gangsters. Who was like just because they knew the game? They're like, well, I'm a gangster. I sell dope, and I got a couple of girls. It was, it was even to this day. I tell you about a, a normal thing in the Bay. You got a rapper. He raps. He sells his records independently. He's not even really that famous, but he got some fans. He's got a little hustle. He might do dabble in some kind of little weed trade or something. Something he does, and he might have a girlfriend who. You know, she don't mind going out and, and taking a couple calls and taking a couple. She goes out and bring home, you know, some hundreds, some thousands every day. And they put it all together. And you're like, who is that dude? Why he got so much jewelry? Why is his car so fly? He's a rapping, pimping, weed selling hustler. Yeah. And it's right now today. You look at him right now like. And that's everywhere, by the way. Okay, but in Oakland, it's a big deal. Yeah. Let me, let me get a. Well, I was just saying, like, it's a part of the culture in Oakland. But, you know, Fresco. as I moved around. You know, because of this job radio, mm -hmm. right? Like, I grew up around that. And as I went to different cities and just saw it might be slightly different mm -hmm. on what they call it, how they go about doing they it. They might have a stripper girlfriend or something, that part. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. um, but ultimately, it's it's the same hustle. Yeah, some weed, a stripper, and a and an independent rap hustle. Y'all got a good household. Yeah. Now, independent rap. Mm -hmm. um, you were selling... The story goes that Too Short would show up to the dope spot and you was making the Dope Fiend beat, which that origins of that music, mm -hmm. you was making music to be played at the drug spot that the drug dealers wanted to buy from you, yes? Yeah, we had, it was like, if, imagine a paper route and you have uh, certain houses you deliver to. We had, it was weed, turfs, and, you know, cocaine, heroin, whatever. It was, it was spots all over the city where they would stand out and hold down the little operation. And we had the we had the green light to like just walk up to every one of those spots and and play the new music for them that we had, and you know that was our routine. Like we would just I didn't have to sell any tape. People say, oh, he was selling out the trunk. He was selling on the bus. We used to sell music to drug dealers. Why did we do that? Because they had money. They had the cash. <laughs> yeah. And it was just that was just our hustle, man. We um we evolved that into uh, customized tapes, which is really one of the things that got us really popular. I had a rap partner named Freddie B. Yeah, he was from uh, Campbell Village, West Oakland, and uh, we really used to just um, make these tapes. Like it would say your name, what block you from, you know, who roll with you. Might even mention family members or what kind of car you wow. drive. And that's every, like the original like custom mixtape, the dub plate. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah everybody yeah. wanted those. Everybody wanted for the shout out. They wanted to hear their name. Okay. Yeah, and you know, the the tape hustle we had back then was five dollars a tape. But if you wanted one with your name in it, you had to pay twenty. And it was like a, it was like a boss thing. Like if you had a tape from Too Short and Freddie B with your name in it, that was like something you'd probably be trying to hold on to thirty years later. Like I still got my custom tape. Mm -hmm. So and I, that I was it was all marketing. We didn't know the word for it, but it was genius marketing. Fast forward to today, mm -hmm. you got a book out. Is that is that what we got? No. No, no. I'm I'm doing an album called The Pimp Tape. No, it's, a, it's, a, it's an album called The Pimp Tape. And I I did write a book. They um I was incarcerated for like five weeks for a a, a glitch in the system from a DUI uh you know trying to yeah trying to turn in all my uh, requirements to the court and they hit me with the um you didn't. You know I turned in this paperwork right. I'm like this is from my community service and the lady's like the the DA is like. Uh, we have a problem with a couple of these dates. And I'm like, well, I did my community service in Oakland. And on the same day, she's like, well, you were in San Diego that day. I'm like, I jumped on a flight that night and did a show. She's like, nah, I'm about to tell the judge that all this paperwork is phony. And basically, man, the lady punked me into taking a 30-day sentence. Damn. And the judge asked the DA, like, uh, well, he didn't have his paperwork. What, what do you recommend? She's like, give him 30 days. He's like, nah, I'm gonna give him ninety. <laughs> what? So I'm sitting there thinking I'm about to go back to my car and you know pay some fine, go home, whatever. They like bailiff taken, kept me in the LA County jail for five weeks, and I I sat there. The LA County is crazy. It's crazy. County it's, it's, jail around There was no the way for you to prove that you weren't lying. Well, my lawyer was standing right there with me. She was like, not only am I gonna tell the judge that you 
you file false paperwork. I'm going to recommend that he give you a year, and then I'm going to file all new charges on you for filing the fake paperwork. And my lawyer was like, take the 30, bro. Just take it. Like, it's L.A. County. You'll be out in two days. I was in there five weeks, like, in the middle of the summer. I was watching the NWA movie premiere. Like, man, I'm supposed to be on the red carpet. <laughs> like, I was hot. Do you think your music and the music that you've made over the years ever plays into something like that moment? Uh, you talking and about who you are, your persona? Are you saying that karma? No, oh. like meaning like people got it in for you. Like they're, they're oh, you, I, you, I, you musically like for instance, if you was putting out that music today, I definitely feel like um that that, that was a personal vendetta, that was very personal from the female yeah uh, prosecutor, assistant DA, whatever she was. She was like, you're going to sit behind. You bar. made freaky tales, and it was the time. You know what it was behind? It was behind that time where I was on TMZ running from the police, trying not to get a DUI. She was mad about that. Mm. She was really pissed about that. But I sat in there for five weeks. Uh, the county jail is very active all during the day. So I devised a technique to just sleep the day away. And when they all lights out, I would wake up in the, at, at 11 p.m. at night. And I just get my little pencil and paper and just write in the dark. And I wrote a book. I haven't uh, put it out yet, but it's a very interesting book. And it's about your life? It's about um, my experiences. That's too short. It's the, it, the book was called... Uh, you got to know when to leave the party. And the whole gist of the book was I never knew when to leave the party. Like, that was why, um, you know, I became, like, OG rapper with the fun songs like Blow the Whistle and still doing tours, chasing young girls and stuff. It's like, you got to, you know, like, just know when to stop. And I just, I don't have that switch on just stop rapping, stop having fun, stop going to the, no. Are you addicted? Um, I think I'm... An addiction to having fun and just... Or addicted to the, the sex and the partying and the whole thing. I, I think at some point I really was, but in recent years, probably since I turned 50, I kind of have just toned myself down. I do have a lot of self-control, and during my 40s, I just didn't see it. I kept saying to the homies, I'm like, I'm like man, that shit, I call it tapping out. I'm like, you tap out, bro. I'm not, I'm not tapping out. I'm not watching TV at 8 o'clock at night. Mm. Sitting on the couch every night with the, I'm not doing it. So I'm going to a fly restaurant every night and then after that we probably hit a spot. But now now I kinda, you know, I I I take a I take a I get more fun out of uh, the hustle. You know, just the competition it. of it going to get yeah, the money. And, and, and then, that. you know, my job, even if as much as I try to tap out, wanna tap out, I have to go to the club tonight. I have to go to the club Thursday night. I gotta go be at the club Saturday. I'm getting paid to be there. So out of the year, are there weeks where you don't have to work? Do you have weeks off? I do that on purpose. I don't take vacations because I, I travel to so many places yeah. that are vacation destinations. I, I do a show somewhere in a vacation city, and I just stay three days and have fun. So um, I don't take vacations. I don't really block out like I'm not working the month of June, but I do block. I do uh, specifically say I'm not working on holidays. I, I Only time I'll do a holiday show is if you pay me like twice my normal rate or maybe three times or just something way over what I want. And then I'll, I'll take a holiday and work. But, you know, I just take certain weekends off, man. I like to do um, what I call a staycation where you don't even leave the city, but you go to like a, a, hotel. a resort hotel. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah and I love those. Yeah, so I, I, I get it in. What was the story? Because you mentioned running from the police on TMZ, and I remember that. I remember when that was reported. What happened with that? I, um... Went to a club that was located two blocks from my apartment, about a block and a half. It was called Supper Club. I walked to the club, and I walked back to the spot with some chicks. We had a little, you know, a little after hangout thing, probably smoked a little bit and had some drinks at the spot, and then they're like, okay, we're going to go home. We left our car at the club. So I'm like, instead of, I should have let them walk their asses back to the club, but I was like, I'll give y'all a ride back around there so y'all ain't got to walk in the middle of the night, probably like 3.30 in the morning. And... When I dropped them off, I did the three-point turn on the mm. side street. Oh, 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 oh. Boop. Turn the light on me. Put me through all the little stuff. I I hadn't had a drink since the club, you know? So it's like been a long time since I had a drink. I'm not feeling drunk. I'm not even smelling drunk or nothing. And he's like, I just need you to, um, after I did all the stuff, he's like, I need you to blow into the breathalyzer. And I'm like, I'm, it's a, it was like a young black dude. I'm like, damn. I'm like, bro. I live right there in that building right there. I'm only, I leave the car right here. I walk to the building mm. like I need you to blow. 
I'm like, man, come on, man, let's do this. You got the like, dash cam on it now. Now they recording. The one that was recording was security from the club. Some person who probably I've been tipping and being homies with, and he over there snaking the camera me. Camera phone out. Yeah, man. He was a sucker too, cause he sold the um, he sold the footage to TMZ for five hundred dollars, and they probably would have gave him five thousand if he would have just asked for it. But I asked him one last time. I said, "Man, what's my options?" He said, "You either got to blow, or I got to take you to jail to have a um, blood test." I just took off running. Like, <laughs> my God, like that's my option. And you know, where you thought you was going? Though, no. <laughs> right up the block. But you too short. Oh, he had my license. It was my car. I was just going. Run up in the house and lock the door and oh and, my god and wait it out. <laughs> and people, do it oh, tomorrow. People always analyze the story because they they got the footage to look at what happened. Yeah. But this is this was a patented formula that had been done multiple times without any failure. I think on that particular day, I go you go back and you and you you play it back in your mind. I'm like one, first and foremost on that day, I was 46 years old, thinking you know I've been doing this all my life. It just I, Lost some steps, and then um, <laughs> oh, man, I lost the steps. <laughs> Not the same. Wasn't the same. Yeah, and, same quickness. My and quickness I was wearing there. like I, when I really thought about, it, I was like, man, a pair of Jordans or something. I did. I was wearing low cut chucks. Yeah, nah, you done. Ran right out of the shoe. Oh man. <laughs> the police. Um, I remember I fell. He didn't even tackle me or nothing. I fell. <laughs> and he's like, why'd you run? Why'd you run? I was like, man, I'm trying to go home, man. I really, in the middle of the night. I, I still got people in the yeah. house. So the lady was mad about that. The prosecutor, she didn't like that whole uh, Hollywood people, you know, celebrities. You, you you pay the fines and you do all this. You get your good lawyers and get off. She was like, I need you to sit down, bro. And she she sat me down. Now, when you look back at your, because you got the pimp tape. And when's it, is this out now, the pimp tape? The pimp tape is November 9th. November 9th. Mm -hmm. um, and pimping and hoeing is very much a thing mm -hmm. everywhere. Uh -huh. um, more so, and it's like an underground culture too. Like, if it's you not don't, really, it's not really about prostitution though. It's it's about a pimping state of mind. Yeah, but I'm just, you know, I'm going to where your music used to be, uh -huh. right? And the uh -huh. things that you've, the stories that you've told in your music. Um, when you when you look at all of the music that you made and telling stories and being vulgar and sex and that whole lifestyle, drugs and sex and hustling, whatever. Um, and you look at where we are now with social media, uh -huh. right? Have you changed how you move? Like, because now, you know, you got some, some allegations popped up on you a few yeah, years I, ago. Yeah, I really got the, you know, the older guy who's not really social media, social media savvy and doesn't really know the power of, you know, how fast it, it moves and how negative it can be. And I, you know, I, I had a few little slip-ups with social media. I had a few little bad blows and you know it really affects the money because these negative stories live on the internet they never go away and it's like nothing you could do positive nothing you could do for the community no giving back no nothing you it's can there. do will be a bigger story than the negative things you do that get portrayed in the blogger you know that get uh, ran by the bloggers and and the uh, you know TMZ if TMZ does it you, it's like that's just that, it's just the, the Bible Locked or something. Stone, yeah. So um, yeah, um, I had a few slip ups once. Once they did me with the um, I was doing a XXL interview about a, a album I was dropping, and I did the interview for like an hour, and then the guy goes, "Hey, we do this little thing on our website where, you know, we have a uh, artist uh, give advice to their younger self," and so he's giving me the context that this goes in his comedy. And I go, okay, well, I'm gonna tell a little too short, like, yeah, you know, when you when you when you you about to come up and I'm telling him how how to be a player. Mm -hmm. And basically the dude before Monday morning, this was like a Friday or something, and before Monday, like Saturday, he puts up on XXL's website that Too Short gives little boys advice on how to have sex. Oh my took it God. and <laughs> Wait. ran saying. me in the dirt, man. Um um and it's, the story just ran. Like I got, I had people like Dream Hampton, like about to whoop my ass, like calling me up on the phone, like, "Are you crazy?" And basically, uh, that was my first blow. That you know, just you gotta, you say this thing, and then somebody takes the quote and like, just does you. And then uh, you know that the the one where um, the, sexual the, assault, right? Yeah, but the TMZ thing was another big one that you know I probably 
10 years before that, I would have ran and got caught and it would have never been, it never been a story. It, just, it, didn't, it didn't cross your mind that that was about to be on TMZ. Exactly. Even though it was great publicity, it just, it, it was embarrassing. <laughs> and then, um, and then, you know, the thing with my, uh, the sexual assault thing, this was like right before Me Too. And it was an artist that I wanted to work with and the friendship was great. The camaraderie, we did a music video. It was, you know, uh, we were friends, and then she was acting very strange and coming around and freaking people out at the studio, like very weird behavior. That I don't want to detail, but it was like the kind of stuff we all hear, and I'm the one that says she's cool to come in, and you all looking at me like, bruh, can you please not tell her to come around? Like she's really weirding us all out. So at some point, I finally said, it's not cool to come around no more. And she came back with this explanation about um, she had a friend. They were in the hospital together when they were little kids, and her friend passed, and she'd been going through some real, you know, you know, personal stuff. So I was like, cool, it's, it's cool, you know, everything's cool. Come on, around. let's make music. And she came right back the exact same way, just being a little strange. And we just felt like we can't do it. When I shut her down from the studio, um, I, um, I got one threat. And it was like, my mother wants to talk to you. And I'm just like, I was like, I'm through it. I'm not going to talk to your mother. You, I'm just, it's not even that type of party. And after that, they just went on, on Instagram and was like, uh, too short. Uh, they, they came to my studio and videotaped the studio. And like, this is just pl- the building where too short raped my daughter. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, I'm like, what? And they went for a long time, uh, uh, up and coming, promise, you know, aspiring artists who was pretty much promoting the music and the image and, you know, turned her whole social media into Too Short Rape Me. And it went for a long time. It went for like four or five months. And then I got a call from TMZ saying, what's up with this with this stuff we're hearing about? And I'm like, it's just a chick on Instagram. And they're like, okay. And then I got another call from TMZ saying, we think we're going to run this story. And I'm like, it's not even a story. They're like, nah, we're going to run this story. And they ran it. And it, they ran it as... The way they worded it, it sounded like I got arrested or something, and it was like a big deal, but it was never anything from the LAPD. It was never any charge. I got a call. I got a visit. I got to go down there. I got an investigation, nothing. It was never anything except some social media posts, and then TMZ ran it, and then all these other people ran it. But then I remember you had text messages proving that it was everything you had with her was consensual. I have a lot of stuff. I have like videos of yeah. us having conversations. I have a, a talking about how it was not any rape or anything. It was just we, we just want to make music and blah blah. It was a lot of stuff. A lot of text messages from a year before the accusation, after the accusation, just clearly saying this didn't happen. So then nothing happens. It kind of like you know just lingers, and all of a sudden I get sued. She sues me for, um, since it's not a criminal case, she sues me for, I guess, I don't know. What, what, the civil charges or whatever. Yeah, and in the lawsuit, it's, it says that, it's, it's saying specific dates. It's like, on this date, he took me somewhere, he pinned me down, I was yelling, no, 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 and he, and he was like, did it something to me, like, he, like rape. And then it says, I went home and I came back two weeks later and he took me to a hotel and he did it again. Then I came back. A month later, he took me over here. It said five or six times that every time she would come back, I would attack her and, and do this thing. And I'm, I just, you know, my lawyers are like, it's it's a two way lawsuit. I had to, based on that, I had to file one for a defamation, and it's it's still lingering right now. But at the same time, it's um not criminal. It was does never. It, does it make it hard with the music? It, does the content of your music catch each up one of you? those negative social media? Viral stories caused promoters to say, uh, we can't, we got to cancel this show, that show. Um, you know, opportunities for like TV shows and stuff, you know, appearances and stuff that would be like, you know, major yeah. bags. Uh, we can't, we can't do it. We don't, we don't promote that image. And then the Me Too came out right after, right in the middle of all that. And it really was like, you know, I remember having a show in Sacramento for some politicians or something. They wanted me to do some luncheon or something, and they, they like, blow the whistle. And They didn't listen to the other music. They come over. <laughs> they had they didn't know the Too Short discography. They literally came to my hotel room, paid me the money, and said, we, we don't, we're sorry for wasting your time, but we can't have you. No, you, no, you can't. 
And it just, it it has a lingering effect. Listen, I've known you how long? 20 years? Uh-huh. I've known you a long time. Uh-huh. If a politician, look, and you're very <laughs> successful. If a politician, a major brand, uh-huh. anyone before all of this had ever come to me like, hey, do you think Too Short is a... <laughs> no. I would have said, yeah, you probably... you. Yeah, nah. Let's, let's, there's a song called Blowjob Betty. Yeah, <laughs> let's start. Let's start back here. And see what you think. You probably want to nah. Yeah, nah. Blowjob Betty. Yeah, that was that was that was a that was a great story. <laughs> <laughs> You're a storyteller. You're a storyteller. One of the yeah. greats, man. But but you had. I mean, it, we are living in a time where the music that you made 20, 30 years did ago did not make me the ideal brand ambassador. Right. No, but now, not in 20 But you're a legend in hip hop. But one thing that hip hop has done for brands now is is you realize that no matter what that rapper represents, I could attach him to my brand now. He's very fucking popular. Right. And that changed. Uh, you know, it could have it could have been different for a guy like me now without the blemishes. Right. I they 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 would totally overlook like Snoop Dogg. They yep. would totally overlook all the the arrest or and the storytelling. All that, and they go, you're a popular person. I'd like you to promote my brand. And I do have, you know, I, we got a great new uh, industry in California, marijuana. Yeah. And they don't care about background and all that stuff. They, they love giving out money. So I found my way into some branding, but at the same yeah. time, I, you know, I got beat up by social media. But also, I'm not mad about this because let's just think, like, some of our older artists, R&B, hip-hop, pop, whatever, we would not have survived and be a- been able to build these legacies had social media been in our era. There no. were things that I was doing. No you think what Eminem was no doing? Way. Yeah, there's things, there's things I was doing that would not fly if it was, like, filmed or or documented. It just wouldn't. It'd be like, bro, like, you did that that night? We talk about that on the show, Rosenberg and Laura. Remember how many times we've talked about, like, Michael Jordan era, mm-hmm. a basketball and sports celebrity? Yeah, and how wild we hear those parties were, yeah, and how and hanging out with gangsters, gambling and partying, and it was it was just mm-hmm. everybody, you know. Yeah, but social media is different, and it has it's very powerful in terms of using it uh, uh, resourcefully to build a career. P- kids can now sit at home. You don't even got to hit the pavement, and you could if you work it right, you could be famous. Um, I like the fact that um, you could just be sitting somewhere on your phone. And just send out a, a post that says, man, I don't like so-and-so, man. He's a bitch ass. And then you go viral. It's popping. You <laughs> and popping. you don't even have to pay your publicist or, or the PR people. You could call another rapper and say, hey, man, let's beat for the next six months. It'd be your homeboy. It Done. Be, we beat for six months, and then we make up and do a tour together. Mm-hmm. And it's it's free marketing, and it's working. So uh, It's a gift and a curse. It is, it is. And um you know, I personally am not major into social media, but I ha- I have definitely went to a and had like a couple of sessions with a social media trainer and you know a media trainer, and basically, uh, you know, I was not the stuff that I learned. I was going to be doing a lot of more of messing up. <laughs> mm-hmm. Like I was, I was not in the right mind of quotes and statements and and the way you should word certain things and and you know it's a it's still a, it's still a um like walking through a minefield to this day we we look at uh all the guys who are thinking they're so social media savvy and then they trip up with one wrong little tweet one wrong little post and everybody goes eh, I don't like you no more yeah. instantly um the pimp tape November 9th mm-hmm. um there's so much I'd love to talk to you about with regard to Oakland and you know hopefully I get to sit with you another time too because I remember when you moved from Oakland to Atlanta, mm-hmm. which was, you know. It was a big deal. It was a huge deal, right? And you, Little John, and y'all really had a movement out there in Atlanta for the it, rap it, scene. It, it gave my career, like, the extension that, you know, I think I probably would have been, like, most of the 80s and 90s rappers from the West and other areas would have just been, like, you know, a cool little fade away. Was that why you moved to Atlanta? No, I moved to Atlanta for the party, man. It was It was a party. It was... It was the Freaknik 1993. Freaknik it was, was the so Jack popular. the Rapper. It was Fife Dog, Eric Sermon. Hip hop was moving there. Yeah, a couple of people like. I'm the only jive artist moving to Atlanta. I don't know, but Eric Eric Sermon, he wasn't jive, but he was one of the first ones there. I remember Eric Sermon and Left Eye used to be a couple. Yeah, oh, no way. 
Yeah. And Eric yeah. Sermon was Def Jam. I apologize. But yeah, um, I didn't know that. I didn't but know. um, you didn't know that? No. By the way, thanks. Uh, remember how we talked about earlier? Too short doesn't know when he stumbles into big things on social media. <laughs> <laughs> well, if I went, if I, if we ran through artists right now, and we spent the next ten minutes, and we said to Too Short, craziest story, insert rapper. Yeah, I know, I know a lot of stories. <laughs> were you, stories. were you seen as, you know, because of your lifestyle, because mm -hmm. the lifestyle you dreamed of as mm -hmm. a kid in Oakland of being the the dude with the cars and the women. Mm -hmm. Became your life, literally, right? Mm -hmm. Was dudes coming to you like, where's the hot spot? Where are all the girls? Where should we hang out? Was that? I was l literally the ambassador. I just started telling people, stop calling me about that, man. I'm, no, I'm not, I'm not going to tell you where to go on a Tuesday night. Like, yeah, I, I was that guy. You call me. You're like, I'm in Vegas. Where should I go tonight? I'm like, go to such and such club. Walk up to the door and tell so-and-so you my boy. You good. I, I was that guy for many years. I was damn near like a concierge or some shit. Damn. Damn. The Pimp Tape, too short. Do your research on this guy. Thank you for your time, man. I can still get you a... Call me. Nah, no, don't call. No, no, you. No, no, See, no, you no. can't turn it off. You said you can't turn it off. You got to turn it off. I'll send some girls over there. Nah, 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 nah. Too short, man. Give it up. The legend. <laughs>